It takes a second. Hello, welcome. We'll just give it a couple moments before we get started. Feel free to shout out in the chat and let us know you're there. Yeah. Tell us where you're Zooming from tonight in the chat. Yeah, it's always fun. Welcome folks. We're just gonna wait just a moment before we get started to let folks trickle in. And if you're able, drop in the chat where you are Zooming from tonight. There's Faye. Hi, oh, Faye. Faye. Hi, Faye. <laughs> All right. Oh, Barcelona. Barcelona. Nice. Wow. All right. Nuria wins. Unless someone can tap that, but. <laughs> we did have somebody from Australia or New Zealand? We, New Zealand. We had New someone Zealand. from New Zealand last yes. time. Awesome. Yeah. It is uh, late in Barcelona. I was, right yeah, now. I was trying to figure out like times and then I was like, I don't have to, I have to focus on other things right now. I can't be trying to do this international math right now. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Feel free to drop in the chat where you're Zooming from tonight and say hi to our authors. I'm Susanna Hermans. I'm co-owner of Oblong Books in, the New, in New York's Hudson Valley. Thank you guys so much for joining us on this Friday night. Um, this event is part of our Hudson Valley YA Society series, which we've been doing for 10 years, I think, at least, um, all in person until the pandemic. And now we get to bring it virtual, uh, which has been um, a real joy amidst the difficulties of the past two years. Um, and tonight, we're so thrilled to welcome back to our series, Kristen Kishore, joined tonight by the incredible Gareth Hines to talk about Graceling, the graphic novel. Um, if like me, you're a big Graceling fan, when you heard that this book was coming out, you freaked out with excitement. Um, not only is it so joyous to see Kristen's story unfold through images, but to have the art <laughs> rendered by Gareth Hines, who is the best in the business, frankly, um, for, for doing what he does, uh, is, is a real gift to readers everywhere and will bring a new audience to the story and a new audience to Gareth's other work as well. So we're super psyched to talk about this tonight. Um, I'm sure you guys all know this already. Kristen Kishore is the author of the Grace Link series as well as Jane Unlimited. She received her master's from the Center of, for the Study of Children's Literature at Simmons College. Um, she's worked as a dog mm -hmm. runner, a packer in a candy factory, an editorial assistant, a legal assistant, and a freelance writer. Gareth mm -hmm. Hines is the creator of critically acclaimed graphic novels based on literary classics, including Beowulf, King Lear, Merchant of Venice, The Odyssey, uh, which got four star reviews and a spot on 10 best of the year lists when it came out. Um, he's the recipient of the Boston Public Library's Literary Lights for Children Award. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. We um, will be taking questions down in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions for our guests, and I hope you do, please throw them down in the Q&A and we'll address them toward the end of the program. Uh, feel free to chat it up in the chat. And I'm gonna turn things over to the two of you and I'll be back for the Q&A in a little while. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susanna. Thank you, Susanna. So, um, I mean, we both want to thank Susanna and Oblong Books for having us today. Um, so, Graceling is a book that, in part, is about truth and lies. Um, you know, it's about the dangers of delusions and denial and the injustices that occur when people are denying reality. And I think it's really important when something is really deeply wrong in our reality to state it out loud. So I just wanna to start today in our own reality and say that racism is real, that the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict today was deeply upsetting, that the fact that Kyle Rittenhouse and people like him are not just permitted, but encouraged to attend civil protests with their deadly weapons is deeply messed up and Black Lives Matter. 
of my heart is going out to everyone who's suffering because of the verdict today. Having said that, um, now I want to talk about Gareth Hines' beautiful adaptation of Graceling. Um, and tell you a little bit about the evolution of this graphic novel. So uh, Gareth and I met, I, sh I should have figured this out the last time we did this, <laughs> but I didn't actually go back and look at it. It must have been over 10 years ago at the Simmons um, Summer Institute where we were both giving a talk and we met, we became friends and, and over the years we kept in touch. And then at a certain point after I had released Bitter Blue, the third book in my Graceling Realm series, I got an email from Gareth one day that said, oh, I just have something little to send you. Uh, what's your mailing address? So I gave him my mailing address. And then shortly thereafter, I received a package in the mail that was like long and flat and like hard, like do not bend sort of package. And I immediately knew Gareth has sent me some art. He has not sent me some little thing. He's sent me some art. And I opened it up and I'm going to share with you what he sent. He sent this just incredible drawing of um, a scene in Bitter Blue. It says, I don't know if you can see at the bottom, it says for and inspired by Kristen Bellamy Hava. So Bellamy is a sculptor who sculpts people turning into other things so that they can escape danger. And Hava is Bellamy's daughter. And this is a sculpture she made of her own daughter turning into a bird. And I just, what, you know, Susanna's words from before, I basically just freaked out. It, I, it is so gorgeous and it's so right for the, it feels right. Everything about it is right for that moment in the story. And this uh, drawing has become one of my favorite possessions. It's always hanging up in my entranceway wherever I've, I've moved several times since then. And it's always hanging up right. One of the first things you see when you walk through the door. And so I wanted to share that with you. Now I'll, pardon me while I fix my own view. Um, and then, so then, you know, he, he did that. And then a few years later, he and his lovely wife, Allison Morris, also a friend of mine, um, were in town and we were having lunch uh, at this wonderful little place called Sofra. And Allison, out of the blue said, Kristen, have you ever thought about having Graceling as a graphic novel? And like, again, inside, I just kind of started freaking out because I felt like this probably wasn't just an idle question. And our, the conversation continued and they asked me, you know, how would you think about Gareth giving it a try? And it was just so, so such an obvious, like so easy to say, yes, there's, I, I don't know who would ever say no to, to such a thing. Like it was just so exciting to me and it felt like such a gift. And then like miraculously, then it happened, you know, it, it took a while to get things into place and to sort out like contracts and all the things you have to do. Uh, but, but suddenly we were talking creatively and Gareth was starting to work on the adaptation and sending me things to look at and then sending me drawings and sending me like, a page that has seven different pose, which one do I like best? And, and things like that, that are just so fun and, and not something I ever foresaw when I wrote the book. And also kind of made the book, um, gave me a new experience of a book that I talked about this a little before, but when Grayson was released, I was an extremely anxious and overwhelmed person. And as a consequence, didn't really get to enjoy that release very much, but this has been enjoyable and it's been a way to, to, to revisit that book uh, from a healthier, happier place, which is also a gift. So now, now here we are. I think that's pretty much, that's my version of the story, Gareth. Yours is, yours is gonna be from a different mm -hmm. point of view. So maybe you should take it over. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's so, um, 
that is totally how it happened. And before that lunch at Sofra, um, which is a fa fantastic place if you're ever in Boston, um, <laughs> uh, what happened was just that that Allison and I, at a certain point, and I don't remember exactly why, but we were we were just chatting about what would be contemporary if I was to adapt something contemporary. Like, what would be interesting books to do that with? And um, and you know, she said like Graceling, and we kind of both looked at each other like, whoa, that's a really interesting idea. Um, and so then, yeah, she brought it up to Kristen and, and we, we, we didn't put her on the spot by saying like, Hey, I would love to do this right away. But you know, we, we then sort of followed up and said, Hey, yeah, like you could um, have, you could have, yeah, but yeah. I appreciate that you, <laughs> you didn't. Um, but yeah, we, I, I followed up and let her know that I would, that I would be interested in doing that. And then she was super excited about it and her agent. Hi, Faye, was super excited about it. And my agent, hi, Jen, was super excited about it. And the publisher got on board and uh, every, you know, everything fell into place um, relatively quickly. Um, the book itself took about two years because it was actually um, a harder adaptation challenge really than I anticipated. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let me, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna show you a little bit more about how that process worked. So, oh. So I'm best known for adapting these classics, um, which is which is definitely challenging. Um, these, especially like the Odyssey and the Iliad, are my best known books, and those are very epic stories. Um, so I have to abridge them quite a bit to get them down to the length for a graphic novel. Uh, but what I found when I started working with Grace Ling was that it was actually very intricate. This novel that Kristen wrote, it had you know, a mystery and a romance and all, all these things kind of overlapping so that each scene had very critical information that, that had to be in it. And so it was it was really challenging to remove material uh, because I would have to then move things around and, and, you know, insert information into other scenes and so on. Uh, for those who don't know the story, which is probably very few of you, but there may be some of you who don't know the story. So um, I'm not gonna go too far into it, but I'll just give you the setup. Um, Katza is a Graceling, which means she's somebody who in this realm uh, has a special power, uh, kind of a, a supernatural ability. And that is sort of um, yeah, cued or, or physically represented by her having two different color eyes. Uh, and we meet her when she's breaking into a dungeon in the bottom of a castle. And it is her job to knock out all of the guards, which uh, we see that she does with astonishing ease. Um, and then she calls her two companions who are coming to free this man uh, from, the, from a cell. And um, we learn that she's rescuing him and he has, he has earrings, which mark him as a Leonid. Leonid is one of the countries, one of the peoples of the Graceling realm. Uh, and then she runs off to knock out more guards while they, while they you know, pick the lock and get him out. Uh, and then uh, partway through this scene, we sort of cut to a flashback um, where we learn more about the origins of her grace and sort of the first time it manifested itself, which was when a creepy guy like touched her and she felt threatened and she reflexively smashed his nose and he died. And then everybody was like horrified, um, and, but except everyone except the king. The king was actually kind of pleased because suddenly he had this new weapon in his arsenal. Um, but of course, Katza herself was horrified uh, and she, she goes and, and sort of tries to get control over her grace by going to the king's spy master, all, who basically helps her learn how to use it to, you know, knock people out and break their bones and disarm them instead of killing them. Uh, and then when, when we get back to the garden, <clears throat> she's running along through the darkness and somebody steps out of the shadows and grabs her. And that's when the sort of the, you know, the first plot twist arrives. Uh, and she throws this person over her shoulder and he lands very lightly and she realizes that he is also graced with some sort of combat. Uh, and they have this sort of exchange where we, we establish that he is a little bit of a smart aleck um, and a very confident character. Um, and, that he, and that he's able to actually you know, avoid a lot of her strikes, um, but then he sort of changes his mind and he lets her go for reasons that we learn later. Uh, although she does knock him out to make sure that he will not sound the alarm. So then basically it's like, we've set up this like mystery of, well, who's this guy they rescued and why was he kidnapped? Who is this guy that showed up? Uh, and then he shows up again at her court. And it turns out that he's looking for the, the grandfather. His grandfather was the guy who was kidnapped and he's looking for him. Um, they <laughs> get into a tussle again. 
Um, they're very evenly matched. And then I, I will skip over a bunch of stuff. They end up going on this kind of epic road trip, which was one of the things that was really fun to draw was all these kind of landscapes that they travel through um, while they're sort of, you know, getting to know each other and, uh, you know, climbing these, these giant mountains. So I've removed text from a lot of these pages to make sure there's no spoilers, um, but that is the, uh, <clears throat> some, of my, some of my favorite, uh, some of my favorite images. Okay, so uh, let me talk a little bit more about the process. This is a, a slide that I show in my school presentations, which is sort of an overview of how pretty much any graphic novel gets made, although every book is different. Uh, but there's usually an outline of a story, a script, which is basically uh, the dialogue, plus maybe some brief descriptions of what happens. Concept art refers to basically designing all the characters, the costumes, the weapons, the settings. Basically, you have to design a whole world, the whole world that this place is, uh, is going to take place in. Uh, and then the thumbnails is an old fashioned word, or sometimes we call it a rough layout or a sketch dummy, which is the entire book in rough sketches with text. You know, basically the first form where it's really readable, both as text and images. And that's where you do a lot of the editorial work and make a lot of um, any changes that need to happen before you put in all the time to do the finished line art and then to add the coloring and speech balloons and sound effects and all that kind of good stuff. And, you know, usually, of course, I'm working, I am used to working from an existing text. It's often not in English, so I might have to read a bunch of translations. Um, I'll usually do a, you know, an outline, just a super rough outline on paper as a way of thinking about the overall structure of the story. Uh, at the same time that I'm starting to sketch the characters and think about the visual designs. And also do historical research uh, into the period where it takes place, uh, which was not so applicable in Graceling because it's not Earth. Uh, just want to emphasize that, even though I used a lot of, of Earth, <clears throat> Earth imagery, let's say. Um, and that my outline for, for Graceling, I actually ended up basically writing a script and then using, you know, in Word, you can basically assign styles to, uh, to like chapter headers so that you can collapse it into an outline. And I found that that was very useful for this particular project because as I mentioned, it was very challenging to condense. And so you can see a bunch of numbers here next to the, the sort of descriptions and the numbers are word counts. So I was keeping track of how many words I was using in each uh, chapter and each scene. And these little summaries were kind of fun to write uh, and were a good way for me to just sort of shorthand, you know, what happens in each of these scenes. Um, and some of them were kind of funny. Um, so for example, when I showed Kristen the draft, um, I, I was hoping that, that she was gonna be amused by this one. For example, Randa doesn't control you, whack, Ashen's not eating. That was one of my, <laughs> one of my chapter titles. And, and she said, I adore these summaries, they keep cracking me up. So I was very pleased that, uh, <laughs> that she enjoyed those. Um, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, and actually this is a good example of a scene where you know I needed Ashen's not eating, that's super important, but I actually ended up taking out most, I, I ended up taking out this scene and putting that information into a different scene. Um, and then this is the right. last page. Sorry, what were you gonna say, Kristen? No, I was just gonna say, right, I, I, I mean, I, I, I just have such a poor memory of my own plots that I need you to remind me what we, at the time I was like, yes. no, no, don't take that out. And now I'm like, wait, what scene is he talking yeah, what, about? What is that? <laughs> <Go on. laughs> um, this is the, this is the last page of that draft, which uh, you can see that, that I have a note here that it says the target length of the script is 50 pages. And this was page 133. Uh, so my, my initial drafts were definitely not short enough. Also, by comparison, this was 36,000 words and my script for the Iliad was 30,000 words. Um, and in fact, this book did end up being as long as my Iliad uh, adaptation. Uh, Kristen also gave me nice little congratulatory things like here she says, yay, when I got to the end. And in general, her comments, <laughs> her comments were super positive. Um, <laughs> There were a couple things where she would say, oh, I think maybe the character should say this instead of this. But basically, um, yeah, it, I, it was basically a joy. And I, and I kind of knew that it would be uh, to work with her um, because, you know, she enjoyed all the stuff that I was sending her. And then, you know, she was really happy with it and was not, you know, like making me um, do things differently than the way I wanted to do them. Uh, yeah. And. And she was also very positive about all the sketches that I sent her. Um, and I, I'm just going to show you a few. I did lots and lots of sketches of characters and costumes and um, just thinking about, you know, different 
uh, cultural influences in the costumes and you know different ways of establishing sort of roughly what time period this would be if it was earth but that it's not that time period and it's not earth um and uh you know like uh, bitter blue is one of my favorite characters to to design and to draw uh this this was one of the this was probably the first sketch of, of Katza where I felt like, you know, I was getting really close. Um, I ended up changing her hair a bit, making it curlier. Um, but the um, basically, this is this is more or less what she looks like uh, in the book. And also, this is where I was testing out different ways of combining digital and traditional materials because uh, I decided that I did want to have like watercolor textures and kind of a watercolor feeling. Uh, but combining that with digital flat colors um, allowed me to have things be a little more precise. And it also allowed me to kind of outsource a little bit of the work. I hired a coloring assistant. I'll talk more about that later. Um, this is one of those things that I sent to Kristen where it was like multiple versions of, of different characters. Uh, this was kind of like after, after we settled on which ones we liked the best. And I sort of did a couple of additional angles of Katz and Poe. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I will refer back to a drawing like this every time I draw that character in, in order to try to keep them looking consistent. I also created sort of a model sheet for all their costumes. Uh, and this was both for my own reference and also, uh, as I mentioned, we hired a, what's called a flatter. We hired somebody to do the digital flat colors. Uh, and this was his reference guide uh, for the colors of the main characters, all their costumes and their eyes. You know, you'll notice I've got eye color up above their heads. Um, and that was very, that was very helpful. Uh, definitely speeded up the process a bit. Um, these are also some uh, watercolors that I did. Uh, I knew I wanted to have at least some watercolor feeling. So some of the sketches uh, I just did with watercolor. And this was one that was very inspirational to me early on where I really felt like I captured the mood that I wanted for that scene. Uh, and actually uh, in the finish, I ended up deciding that I needed to redraw this with more detail, more precision. Uh, but this inspired me to have some panels later on in the book that are just watercolor. Uh, or where just the background is just watercolor because I like the feeling of this so much. So now what I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about these rough layouts and how I do those. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna demo this because it's always really interesting for people to see. So I'm drawing off the side here on a, a tablet and uh, the program that I use for these now is Adobe InDesign, which was not, is not really meant to be a drawing program. Um, you know, most people draw in Photoshop or Illustrator, uh, but there is this freehand pencil tool and if I'm drawing, you can sort of see like a blue line going behind the pencil. And when I let go, it'll snap to a black line. And I've gotten pretty good at, at drawing quickly with this tool. And um, at this stage, I really want the drawings to be pretty loose, um, especially for, you know, you'll see it, especially for the, the smaller drawings, um, but also, you know, if I, um, if I draw a bigger face, uh, let's put it, let's put cats in here. I can get a lot more, I can get a lot more detailed when I'm drawing larger with this pencil. Can I ask you a question, Kara? Yeah. Are you, are you what it seems to be doing that you are drawing over here while looking here? Yeah. Your hand is over. You're not looking at your hand. You're that's, looking at the screen. That's correct. Yeah. And it takes a little while to get used to. Um, a lot of, you know, um, I mean, at this point, I am an older illustrator, but a lot of people in the generation older than me were like, are, are like, I just can't do that. I can't, I don't have the I can't fool my brain to do that. Uh, but then the next generation younger than me, they just grew up on this technology and they're like, what, what? this is how we draw it. Like, um, now I will say this tablet, I can draw directly on, on this tablet while I'm looking at it. Um, but for a presentation, you know, I do it this way still. Um, so, okay, so this is, so this is Katza. Um, she's looking a little smug in this drawing. Um, and you can see that like I've, like you can tell who it is and there's a fair amount of detail, but you can also see that this line is like super bumpy and things don't quite mat come together at the corners and things like that. Um, and obviously I've drawn over the, the text. Um, so one of the things that's nice is that each of these lines is its own object that I can sort of move around if I need to clean things up a little bit. 
Uh, but also I just know that this, I'm never going to get the line out of this that I want for the finished art. And therefore it actually helps keep me sort of moving quickly and staying loose at this stage. And then I can group those lines together. And now I have a character who is an object that I can move around. I can scale, you know, I can squash, I can stretch, I can flip whatever I need to do. I'll group Poe down here and maybe draw, maybe Kat says walking alongside him. Maybe she's got the backpack. I, don't, I mean, I'm just making this up. This doesn't actually go with the, with the text. Um, maybe draw in a little background. Uh, and so basically at this stage, uh, it's all about just kind of trying out different ideas for what we wanna see with each piece of dialogue. You know, maybe, um, for example, maybe uh, I want to come down here and have her, you know, saying that when she, you know, um, again, this doesn't really quite fit with, with what I've drawn here, but, um, and then maybe, maybe up here, I might actually want to have um, some other, like, maybe we just see them walking along and we're focused more on the background, right? That also one of these big mountain scenes, for example. Um, so it's all about, at this stage, it's all about making these decisions of like, what am I gonna show and what am I gonna emphasize in terms of you know, what I'm sort of zooming in on or, or what, kind of, uh, uh, what kind of a shot I'm doing as if I was a cinematographer with, a, you know, with an invisible camera, um, you know, talking about close-ups and long shots and medium shots and all of that sort of thing. And it allows me to, to work with the type very precisely, which is actually, that's actually the reason I use this tool instead of something else, or it's probably the main reason is because it allows me to very fluidly and precisely uh, work with the type and drag it from one page to another, um, change the, you know, the size and shape of the text box, et cetera. Uh, so basically that is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch back to my slideshow here and I'll show you some of the finished layouts. Um, that's what I'm doing at that stage, basically trying to get it to this point where you can really read the whole story visually. Uh, and at that point, I send it to, the, to my editor, I send it to Kristen, I send it to a few other early readers to get feedback, um, you know, make any changes that I need to do in terms of pacing or clarity, you know, anything that confuses people. Uh, and you can see here off to the sides on the margins, I've dragged lots of other drawings off. Uh, in, for example, this is a scene where she's at the archery range and there's a little mini scene that comes before that, uh, that I had to cut where, uh, she throws her, she takes off her earrings and she throws them into a fountain. So I drew that scene. Um, but then it just, it didn't work out for space. I didn't have enough pages. And also you have to be careful of the page turn. If you have like one page that throws, you know, that doesn't allow you to have the page turn where you want, uh, sometimes you have to cut things to get that. Um, this is a little bit more from that sequence. And you can see again, lots of things that I'm dragging off to the side that I tried that didn't work as well. Uh, especially when you get into a fight scene, I'm trying out lots and lots of different sort of um, poses and um, you know, interactions from different angles, uh, lots of different things that I, that I need to try out uh, before I get to the one that I think is the best. Uh, so here is a rough sketch uh, for a page that I've lightened up to a light blue, and then I've drawn with uh, digital ink and with traditional ink down at the bottom. And then uh, this is the flat color that I got back from our flatter, Frank Reynoso. Uh, did a great job with that. And then I'll combine that with a very simple watercolor painting that I would do just of the shadows and some of the color masses in the background. And then it creates an effect like this when you combine them. So it looks sort of watercolored, especially if I put like a watercolor texture over everything. So I'm just gonna go back and forth there for a second. See, so this is just the flat color with the watercolor, but then with another texture, it sort of even enhances that effect. Uh, and then lastly, I will add this, the borders and the speech balloons digitally, and then the text, which I'll leave out because of spoilers. Um, so, <clears throat> That's the art. Now, the other thing that's important is schedule. Um, this project did go off the rails a little bit schedule wise. Originally, it was intended to be a 200 page book. 
Um, but when I was doing the script, um, I actually fell behind immediately because it was clear that it was going to be longer and I was trying to cut it down, but I also knew I was going to have to add pages to the schedule. So I reset the schedule after I had, after I had gotten, you know, 90 pages into the layout. Um, and, and the point of the schedule, I should say, is first of all, to establish the delivery date by just basically figuring out, well, how fast can I draw this book? And then as I go along, I can actually check my real progress against my intended progress. And that's where I come up with these things like, oh, I'm two and a half months behind. That's really bad, by the way. That's why I had to reset the schedule. <laughs> um, but then I was on schedule for a while, but then I got late due to new page count. I adjusted the schedule and then coronavirus hit and I had to adjust the schedule again. So um, all of that stuff kind of happened during the first half of this. But, you know, then the second half went along like I was behind, but I wasn't, you know, I was sort of keeping up with the same pace until near the end where I got six weeks behind, but then I managed to catch up at the end. Uh, so it was, it was a little bit frenetic, but, um, but the book did get delivered uh, only a couple of days on 12.4 instead of 12.1, only a couple of days late relative to the adjusted um, deadline. Now, you'll also notice this is in Microsoft OneNote, and there's a bunch of other tabs up here, uh, like... This is edits to line art. Uh, so I would keep these long, long lists of things that I wanted to fix when I read through it and when, when other people read through it. And especially my wife, Allison, who has a super keen eye for like facial continuity. Um, I, would, I would make these super long lists of what needed to change. And you can see that it's not every page, but it's like a lot of the pages had something um, that needed fixing at each stage. This particular one is post-delivery. So this is the last set of edits that I did. Um, but there were also edits to the layout and there were also edits um, when I had just done the line art before I colored it. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up, but I wanna show you uh, just a little bit of how I designed the cover. Um, so I do lots and lots of sketches for cover designs because I really wanna explore like a very large possibility space. And I'm actually not very good at cover design, I don't think. So I make up for that by just trying lots and lots and lots of things. Um, some of them are sketches on paper, some of them are digital, um, some of them are drawn on the iPad, some on my PC, some of them I put text over to see how they'll look, you know, um, this is just completely placeholder text, but just to see how it fits. Um, some of them I'll work up with tone, with like grayscale um, tone on them. Lots of variations of some of the ones that I thought might that work. That is a, a lot of cover scares. It's a lot. I, <laughs> I shared I some didn't... of these with Kristen, but not all of them. <laughs> yep. Uh, I did a bunch. I, I worked up color for some of them. Um, I liked this one for a while. I was, I was really into this one that shows her in front of like a grove of poe trees. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, and then, you know, some, some of the other ones that we liked enough to, to, do, to do color. But ultimately, this was the design that people really liked the most. And this was the rough sketch with some placeholder type. Uh, and again, I think this was actually Allison's idea or her suggestion that I, that I played around with and, and, and mocked up um, to have little like scenes in the daggers. Uh, the finished art was first a watercolor of the daggers, then digital line art on top of that, then another watercolor for the background, digital color flat color and then a little you know some highlights uh a watercolor pattern that i digitally you know replicated so or mirrored it uh and then the scenes in the daggers were drawn separately and composited in and then i sent it in with this type and then the designer played around with it and we ended up with this type uh for the final Oh, and the, the last thing I just oh, want to say, yeah. I left this in from last time. Last time I was actually giving a shout out to our, um, our host, our moderator, Cecilia, but I still want to thank her here, uh, which is um, Cecilia Cackley, who is a bookseller at East City Books. Um, she was kind enough to uh, actually take some designs that I had done and embroider them because I had this crazy idea that a certain character's backstory would be told in embroidery. Um, and, uh, and then I, I sort of... Um, she, she embroidered the outlines and then I colored it in acrylic, um, you know, sort of transparent acrylic. And then I did the sort of digital alteration of the final panel. And I was really pleased with how this came out. It's one of my, you know, like crazy ideas that really worked. <laughs> it's so wonderful. And you, you, are you going to say the, hint, give the hint and the, here? Well, and, and there is, there might, there might be a little Easter egg on this, on this page. So for those who have read the series. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so I'm gonna, I'll stop there. I'm gonna get out of the screen share, boom. And yeah, so that is how the book, how the book happened. <laughs> Gareth, I came up with a couple of questions. Hooray. And I, tr I tried to write them down. Oh, um, so, so one thing I was curious about what you're talking is you mentioned your early readers. And I have found with early readers that it's useful for me to have early readers who have read the previous books, like who know the series and early readers who haven't. And I'm curious yeah. with this approach and maybe with your other books as well, if you give these books to early readers who know the story already and or yeah. Yeah. readers who don't. Yeah, so I gave it, I first gave it to you, my editor and Allison for the like the first pass. Uh, and then I saw I deliberately sought out some people who had never read the series um, to see if you know what they understood and Things what they and there was some really great feedback that came out of that because people would be like, wait, why did that guy get kidnapped again? I don't think you ever explained that or you know, and then I was like, oh yeah, I sort of explained it, but not really. I should make sure I really explain that and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so I found that was super important and um, and of course, it's hard because there were, I needed feedback at a couple of stages, so I had to find different people uh, who, yeah, <laughs> who had really right. never read it. People with fresh eyes. Yeah, and I'm sure you found this that like it's hard to find. You have to you have to show it to a bunch of people and see who actually has good feedback for you because some people love everything you do and some people right. just can't explain what their problems are with it. And yeah, I yeah I feel <laughs> like over time you kind of develop the stable of of yeah. people who are willing to be honest. Yeah. That's yeah. really important, but also kind. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. Yeah. And then my other question that I jotted down. Oh, so you had, when you were talking about your schedule, um, you seem to me shockingly able to figure out how long it's going to take you to do things. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's, if this is an art writing difference or like, so many times for me, I'll have a sense, but I don't know when I'm actually going to get to something that I can't figure out or that isn't going to work yeah. or that I have to write 15 times before I figure it out. And so I'm wondering, does that happen? Yeah. Does that not happen as much with what you're doing or does it happen? And then you just change so your schedule. I think it is largely an art writing difference um, because yeah, I, I know lots of writers and they who just say, yeah, like I have no idea how long anything's going to take. Um, and, and, and editors have told me like, yeah, you know, you're like, you're good at scheduling this relative to auth among <laughs> authors, but like among illustrators, it's not so unusual to be able to say how long something's mm -hmm. going to take. Cause you know, roughly like how much detail is in an illustration and how long it's going to take you. Um, so yeah, and, and indeed that is one of the reasons why you haven't, you know, why I haven't published a, a graphic novel that's of my own original like writing. Part of it is that I sort of got into doing adaptation because I wasn't really that satisfied with my own writing. And so I am just hypercritical of my own writing in general. Uh, but also I know that, you know, these projects take a tremendously long time, but at least it's a semi-predictable long time. And if and when I'm writing something original, unless I've already completely written it when I signed the contract, there's like a huge question mark in that schedule. Yeah. <laughs> huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think right. we should turn it over? Should we ask Susanna to yeah. come back? Yeah, and Susanna, come back. Come back. <laughs> Oh, you guys, this has been so wonderful. We have some questions from the audience and I will say we have some time left. So if anyone has a question they didn't get to, to ask it, please do in the chat or use the Q&A feature um, and we'll try to get to it. So I have lots of questions too, but let's start with, yeah. <laughs> with the actual audience. Um, so one of our guests is asking Kristen, what made you decide to do an illustrated edition of Graceling? The chance to have Gareth Hines illustrate my work. I mean, that's it's as simple as that. When it when Gareth approached me about it, it was just an instant yes, please, because I have known and loved Gareth's work for a long time, and I just think I don't know you would I don't know what would be wrong with you if you said no. 
no, I don't want you to draw my characters. Um, it was just such an opportunity and such a gift. And and I and I was also able to let it let it go, like let it be Gareth's project. I think that I, so I did not want to do the adaptation myself, and I, because I think that would have been um, agonizing. I already wrote this book. I don't want to write it again. Um, but but to let Gareth take it and and make it his own was just a really exciting thing to watch. Yeah, and I'm just going to say that like I I wouldn't have approached Kristen and I haven't approached many other authors like because I don't know how that relationship and that process would go, but I had such a high degree of faith that, you know, our mutual admiration for each other's work and each other's process um that that it was going to go great and, and I knew that she didn't want to try to write the graphic novel and um yeah. and that she trusted me to do what I do um and I also yeah. sorry I'm totally just jumping yeah. in and interrupting you but I also feel like we're people and we know this about each other but we're yeah. people who if we weren't okay with something we would say it we like mm -hmm. we we could not only expect each other to be like excited and kind but we could expect each other to be honest yeah and I yeah. think that's really important, like it, part yeah. of the whole relationship, yeah, totally. creative relationship. And as a follow-up to that, Gareth, what what was it like working on a book where the author was alive? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if if it would if, if 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 that was always this good, I would I would you know always want to work with living <laughs> authors. Um, it was it was fantastic. Um, it was lovely. Now the the, I think I learned that, and I don't like, I think this is partly Kristen's writing, but also the modern novel is more like more intricate than I had given it credit for, you know, after working on <laughs> epic poetry for so, so many years. Um, and so, you know, that, that was the only thing that was sort of unexpectedly difficult. And, uh, and that will, you know, give me pause or, or just, you know, I'll be forewarned the next time I go to adapt a modern novel. Um, is that it's going to be trickier than, you know, than it may at first appear. Maybe you don't think about it this way, but I'm wondering how you balance um, action with emotion in your work. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, they're both super important and the, um, in general, there's a fairly clear distinction in the script. You know, it's like um, when you go into an action scene, it's almost like you're entering a different storytelling space um, because it's all about like, okay, the normal rules are out the door and like what happens, like what happens in this like chaotic melee. Um, whereas much of the story is about okay, we're not at that point, but there's a lot of strange, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, heightened emotional stuff going on and how are characters responding to it? And that stuff is, is tricky, but I also think the graphic novel is a great format for dealing with that, like that type of emotional tension. Um, you know, it's very, the drawings of the characters can be very expressive in terms of emotion and, um, you know, the sort of pregnant pause is a very powerful device in a graphic novel. And, um, you know, just seeing like, is a character yeah. like facing the other character or turning away, like all those kinds of things. And it feels like a lot less cliched too than saying those things in words. There was a pregnant pause. <laughs> That's... Yes. Yeah, it's funny. There are things that, that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a, an example from another book. When I adapted Macbeth, there were a bunch of things that um, that were sort of like images that Shakespeare used. And I made them very literal in the graphic novel. And at first I was like, I don't know if I want to make it totally literal. That might be too, you know, too much, but then it totally worked. You know, it's like making these visual symbols, um, you know, very, very literal actually isn't too heavy handed in that medium where it would be in words. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's funny. Kristen, yeah, but, was it? Oh, but, I'll, but I'll also say that that's also one of the places where, you know, where a good, a good reader is also important because I want to know mm -hmm. if the emotional depth of the scene is coming across and, and right. you know, are they believing what's going on? Kristen, was it hard for you to turn your 
baby over to another creator? No, because I felt, first of all, you know, as I've said, I trusted Gareth, but also I felt like my baby is still my baby. Gareth is making something else. Yeah. You know? So, you know, I, when I work now, if I'm writing um, scenes with Katza in, and Poe in them, which incidentally I am, um, I'm not picturing anything different than I ever was picturing, which is more like what I picture is like a murky nothingness, but I'm, I don't have Gareth's pictures, Gareth's characters running through my head. They're still just sort of like, I, I don't so much see my characters as feel them. So um, it didn't, like one of my fears that I might have had would I think could have been that seeing my characters there on the page is going to change the way I think or feel about characters that I then might want to write about. And that might feel like interference, but that hasn't happened at all. That's great. Gareth, we have a question for you from Rebecca. She would like to know, how did you learn to do this? <laughs> did you study formally? And when did you know that you wanted to write slash adapt graphic novels? So uh, I've always drawn uh, and my drawings have always had kind of a narrative quality to them. Um, but I, so I, so I basically always knew that I wanted to do like illustration as opposed to maybe fine art or conceptual art or something like that. Cause that was my sensibility. Um, but I didn't, I went off to art school and I was doing all kinds of things, printmaking and editorial illustration and book covers and all, all kinds of stuff that I thought would be, you know, would be really fun to do. And, and if, there's some parallel world maybe where I pursued one of those things, but comics was the thing that I kept coming back to. And it was what I did for my thesis project. And my thesis project turned into my first graphic novel. And then my first graphic novel oh, turned wow. in, was an adaptation of a Brothers Grimm fairy tale. And then I was like, oh, I really like adapting existing stories. So then I did Beowulf. And then I realized that there was this educational market and that these adaptations of the classics were actually a valuable tool for introducing young readers to them. And so then I just sort of never looked back uh, after that. What has it been like to watch graphic novels take off? I mean, the, how, where they are today versus where, when your first book came out? So um, initially it was amazing. Like, well, okay, initially it was amazing, but also felt slow in the first, you know, like when I was starting out, like graphic novels were just starting to get momentum as a, as a as a not just a niche art form, like Mouse had come out, people un understood what the medium was theoretically capable of, but there weren't a lot of other books like that to follow on. Um, but then slowly that started to build. And then it felt like I was riding this amazing wave, uh, which was very, very beneficial. Um, and now it's like, it's, um, it's even more amazing in the sense of how much there is for the reader um, but now I'm also like, you know, it's like I, I start to, you know, bite my nails just a little bit because I see how much really awesome stuff is coming out. It's like, wow, it's, you know, it's a competitive marketplace, even, you know, to a degree that it was not uh, 10 years ago or whatever. But it's all, it's all great. Um, yeah, I love it. That's fantastic. So, Kristen, you just hinted to the fact that you are still writing these characters. Does that mean we get another book? There is going to be another book. I'm uh, not allowed to state when it's coming out or what the title is, but I can say, because I have already said on Twitter and places that it is, it's, it's based on Hava, the character from originally from Bitter Blue, who was in the drawing that I shared that uh, Gareth drew. She's not a baby anymore. She's 21, I think now. And uh, I'll be able to say more about it soon. And if people Excellent. haven't read Winterkeep yet, Winterkeep is awesome. Everybody should read it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. I just dropped it into the chat, but we have like a couple of signed copies left of Winterkeep oh, at the store. So excellent. grab them if you want one. Um, Gareth, what is next on the docket for you? And I know some authors hate these questions, so feel free to pass. <laughs> Well, uh, so actually the answer is I don't know. Uh, I sort of took this past year to experiment and try to pull together a bunch of different project ideas and none of them is under contract yet. Um, so, um, but what, what I will tell you is that um, my, the book that I get the most requests for is the Aeneid. 
And so it's very likely that at some point in the next couple of years, I will take on the Aeneid. Oh, that, that's going to be a good one. <laughs> it's going to be another giant project. And a big one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you in five years. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we have just a couple of minutes left. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to throw them in the mix. Um, we always, in this uh, author series, we like to talk about process. And I'm really curious what the process was working with your editor on this book. I'm curious about that too. Well, so first of all, I should mention there were there were a couple editors. Um, uh, so I want... A couple of times I sort of got handed off in terms of who the primary editor was. Um, um, this is really embarrassing. So Amy Cloud is currently the editor who is my contact person. Um, Kristen, do you remember who the main editor was for most of I the- I knew yeah. you were gonna ask me that. Yeah, damn it, all right. Uh, I'm very embarrassed. Um, uh, so am I. They, they were all awesome. And also there was a, there was a editorial consultant um, which was Carol Burrell. And also there was a designer, uh, uh, Caitlin Yang. And so all of those people were sort of pooling their comments and sending them to me. And so I don't actually know like what comment came from who, um, except sometimes they would leave comments like on the PDF in, you know, that were like their own signatures or whatever. Um, but they, they all had different kinds of feedback, you know? So like, um, Oh, and there's also then there's a copy editor. So actually the biggest volume of comments comes from the copy editors because they are doing the like really nitpicky stuff with the text. But also it turns out that for most publishers, the copy editor is the person who gets stuck being nitpicky about like say continuity and saying, oh, that you know, you had the dagger on the left side here and it's on the right side here or whatever. Um, so, so the most comments came from them, but then also like, you know, the designer is giving me comments about how things are placed or what, you know, typography or whatever. And then the, um, the editorial consultant, Carol Burrell, she was doing a lot of great feedback about like pacing, um, and like, uh, clarity and, and some of those emotional scenes. Um, and, and then the, you know, the sort of the main editor is giving me a lot of high level stuff, uh, again, about like you know, maybe this is too rushed or this, this could use more room, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, and it's different with every round. It's like some people have a lot of feedback in the rough sketches and then not so much later on. And then other people really need to see the line art before they really can give you a strong opinion. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, I would say it was always a pretty light touch. There was never like, oh my gosh, these 20 things need to change. You know, it was never like that. Um, it was just like, oh, this could be, maybe that would be better if you did, you know, if you took these two panels and made it four panels or whatever, you know, like, yeah. That's great. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I'll end with this more nebulous question, <laughs> which is, and you know, at this point, both of you are established in your careers. You've been doing this for a while. You know what you're doing, theoretically, right? What, what advice, I'm not even going to ask you for advice for new authors. I'm going to ask you for advice for your, for your folks who like you are in the middle of a long career. What, what words of wisdom do you feel like you have, or what discoveries have you made this deep in your work? Well, so I think that, um, there's a sort of a constant reinvention process that happens. And um, I think you either have to embrace that or, or run away from it. Um, and so I know people who have been very, very successful and I'm not putting this down at all. You know what you do well and you churn them out. And that, that, is, that is not only how you make money, it's like how you satisfy your fans. Um, but I think Kristen and I are both in the other camp where it's like, you really embrace the idea that you don't want to repeat yourself. You want to like be constantly exploring and experimenting and learning. And that's going to be a little painful. So you have to embrace that it's going to be a little painful. Yeah. <laughs> right. And there's going to be a lot of uncertainty because every time if you're starting new, you don't actually know that you can do the thing that you are going to try to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess I would add to that I'm not, I'm not sure how eloquently I'm going to be able to put this, but 
there's a lot of noise that goes with being a, a published writer. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of responsibilities that aren't writing, and there's a lot of um, pressure sometimes, and sometimes there's a lot of excitement about something that you finished writing a long time ago. Um, so, so you're kind of always off kilter in terms of where you are with something and where other people are. And I think, and, and you're, you're sort of made to feel that the most important thing is the release and the excitement of the release. Uh, uh, but what I've found is that in fact, the most important thing is the two or four or five or, or like on a really good day, six hours, that I'm sitting by myself in a room at my desk doing the actual like frustrating but exciting, um, sometimes like grouchy making, but sometimes really satisfying work. Like those hours when I'm actually doing it, that's why I do this. And the other stuff has wonderful aspects to it. And I couldn't keep doing this if it weren't for the release and so on. But for me, it's, re it's, a, it's it always comes back to, oh wait, it's the writing. It's because I enjoy the writing. I'm not sure what message that is exactly, but I, but it, I have definitely determined that it's really important to me. Yeah, the, I'm just going to say one more thing, which is that, you know, if when it comes to advice, I feel like if you ask me something an hour later, I'll give you a completely different answer. So, you know, take everything with yeah. a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, often the opposite thing is also true. Right. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. That's a great place to wrap it up tonight. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'll mention that yeah. we do have signed copies signed by both Gareth and Kristen at oblongbooks.com and signed books make fantastic holiday gifts. Um, if you can't get it from us, get it from your local independent bookstore. Uh, make sure they know about this book and have a big pile of it on their shelves this holiday season. Kristen and Gareth, Thank you so much. This was a really joyous evening. And this is actually our last virtual event of the year. So wow. um, I'm just over the moon thrilled that we got to spend it with you too. And we can't wait until we can see you both in person at the bookstore. Yay. Happy Thank holidays, everyone. You. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks for coming.